This podcast is brought to you by Steinberg, creators of the VST protocol, the award-winning digital audio workstation Cubase, and audio interfaces. At Steinberg, we put creativity first. Learn more at Steinberg.net. Hey, it's Larry Crane. Welcome to the Tape Op Podcast. Engineer and mixer Jeff Swan has gone from university student to studio owner to producer Spike Stent's assistant back to studio owner and is now a go-to engineer and mixer for some of today's most exciting artists and producers. He has had a hand in the music of Ed Sheeran, Cardi B, Mahalia, Yancey, Five Seconds of Summer, Paul McCartney, The Weeknd, One Direction, Vance Joy, Liam Gallagher, Duran Duran, Charlie XCX, and more. Jeff's name kept showing up on record after record, and in many conversations, so it seemed like a good time to catch up and get a sense of his career trajectory and his approach to mixing. Tell me a little bit about your your very early sort of dips into uh, recording and what got you interested in it and, and you know wanting to pursue it as a career. Well, I think like a lot of people, when I was a teenager, I, you know, I was playing in bands and, you know, trying to be a guitarist. And, you know, I, I sort of like, I think for a long time, I was just convinced that that's what I was going to do. I didn't really have any kind of career plan, but I was just like, you know, I'm going to play guitar and somehow I'm going to make this work. And um, I guess when I when I finished um, school, uh, my my folks were really keen for me to go to university and they were like really unsure about me trying to pursue a career in music um, and I ended up going and doing a degree in music technology but it was a it was a what like a bachelor of science degree so it was very very technical based um, and so I after like two years of that um, I you know we've been doing a lot of like quantitative mathematics and stuff that like I can't really remember now it's you know it's like it's just stuff I should remember but you know I don't and um like I came back after my came home after my second year and I was like I really need to get some hands-on experience in the studio um and I just started knocking on doors um and had a lot of doors shut in my face because you know like there's always there's always people looking for work experience and you know there's 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 always more people looking for places than there are available and I i happened across like this there's this rehearsal space that I used to rehearse in with my my bands when I was a a teenager and I mean it was an incredible project called Bass Connection and basically when we were kids you could go in and rehearse in there for like one pound a night which you know it's nothing like three hours you could go in there and rehearse with your bands and it was run by these two amazing people Rose and Keith Gale and they had a they had a basement area to the building that they used for these rehearsal rooms um, and there'd always been a, a recording studio in there of some description um, and I I kind of I called up the guy that was running it at the time a guy called Pete Abbott and um sort of asked him if I could potentially get some work experience and you know he sort of said no there isn't work experience available and fortunately because I knew knew the guys that ran the center from from those years ago when I was rehearsing in bands Rose um sort of said to him you should you you know you should meet Jeff he's all right and um Pete and I sort of developed this friendship and we're still good friends to this day and he sort of let me let me come in and and sort of sit in on sessions with him over the summer that I was back um and he had this parallel career going at the time where he was doing doing monitors for a band and uh, they were going off on tour in in the, in the September when I was going back to university and he said oh, I'm probably gonna you know have to close up the studio whilst I'm on tour and I just sort of jumped <laughs> like jumped in and said oh how about letting me run the run the studio for you whilst you're away on tour and uh, I think he was pretty unsure about it at first but um I kind of convinced him it was a good idea and uh and he he sort of let me let me run the studio whilst he he went off and toured the world um, doing monitors, and uh, so it would, I mean that was fantastic. I managed to finish my degree via distance whilst doing doing this, and it also you know it meant I was doing really what I was going to university to do. You know, to I was I would it seemed like a too good an opportunity to miss, and it 
the great thing about this place is that I could bring in bands from outside of the youth music project, but there were all these young bands that rehearsed there that had maybe never been in a studio before or had very limited experience. And so whilst my experience was super limited as well, you know, I was able to, you know, learn with them and there wasn't the there wasn't necessarily the pressures or expectations that you had working um, in a commercial studio. Um and and having paying clients come in that that you know expecting you to get incredible results when I you know at the time I really didn't know what I was doing I was sort of learning on the job as it were, um, but yeah I mean that that's kind of that's where I where I started, um, and it it was a it was a really great time looking back on it. What what was the studio fairly uh, well equipped or was it where there pretty limited um, resources in terms of gear and. Well, this was this was sort of like mid two thousands, and I mean, I guess at that time, like the studios around, but you know, that the were that were operating commercially, a, a lot of them were still tape based, and a lot of them were, had been run for years by people that didn't necessarily have any interest in in you know changing from that, um, and you know, Pete being you know he, he being a sort of younger guy and and a, and a fay with like the technology he had a you know a, a g4 mac in there with a digi 002 and then these older lisa sadats like a hooked up to that so we had like we were able to record 16 channels at a time and then you know i think we had a soundtracks desk in there um and a couple of like small bits of outboard like some behringer compressors and um some like uh, TL audio compressors and it was just it was it was basic but it was it was functional um but it, it was it, it definitely once I got confident with the the gear and the routing in there what was what was brilliant um about it and and very appealing to a lot of like the bands in the local area was the fact that where you had these 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 studios that were still working on tape that they could go to like the coming in and, and using you know at the time was you know like relatively advanced like they could come in and and lay stuff down and edit stuff and and achieve a you know a quality that and in in a quicker amount of time than they could previously um so that that definitely kind of gave me a niche if you like in the in the local area when you go back and listen to those things now i don't know if you have i mean do you do you hear anything you like about your early work or anything that's kind of stuck stuck with you or your productions or engineering uh to this day well like at, at the at the time it was um yeah the, the as i say the control room that was the was this like small room it sounded terrible and um but the the live room was kind of you know a reasonably good size and and i i i stumbled across some recordings from that time um over the last sort of lockdown period we had over here and um i found some found some drum recordings i did and i like sort of made my own samples from them you know this, and actually a lot of them they, they, they don't sound anywhere near as bad as i remember them sounding um i think like at, at the time you you every any time that i any time that i learned a new technique you know um during that period it, it like felt like such an advancement just like even even really like simple things like you know grouping drum tracks together and like learning that you could tab to transient in pro tools and cut stuff up like that kind of thing was just you know super um you know super rewarding and so like it, more than like i i listen back to some of those recordings and i cringe a little bit at how they sound but you know they but Equally, uh, they sort of flood back memories of like, oh yeah, that's when I rem- I learned how to do this, or that's like the first time that I recorded the shells of a drum kit without the cymbals, and then recorded the cymbals over the top, or whatever it, technique it might be. Like it was a really great, you know, it, I've got such fond memories of that place and 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 the experiences. Uh, was your next step uh, to start working with Spike Stent? Well, we I, I guess the, the next sort of step was like I I'd been running this studio in in this town Salisbury in the in the south of England, and then through like the wonderful world of MySpace, I met this other producer Neil Kennedy, who was running a small studio in a, the next city over, um, Southampton, and we kind of we 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 got chatting and um, we we decided that actually like it made more sense for us to kind of join forces and try and build a studio that we could. Uh, like both work in and you know and build something that was better and more functional than what we each had i think at the time he was in kind of these um this this like railway arch um setup which was like not ideal for him and you know i i was at the point where i i, I felt like i needed to do my own thing um so we we um we we took over a farm building um just outside of southampton and um 
built a studio there uh, and i mean they're, they're still they're still running it now and i mean it you know it's it's an amazing place we, we built that over over the course of the sort of five years i worked with with neil there um we we built you know the initial studio then we built a second studio so that we could both be working at the same time and then we we eventually built this sort of um 80 square meter live room so that we could record bands live it's you know huge space in a barn and i mean they've they've expanded it even more now and and you know they're really they they record a lot of like rock and hardcore bands and i mean they're they're always busy it's a you know fantastic setup and you know they're they're incredible engineers and and that was that was brilliant to to link up with somebody who you know, had different, you know, a different approach to, to doing things um, than I did. And, you know, you very much like, I, I certainly, I've always felt like that throughout my career, like every time I work with someone else, you kind of get, that they provide some sort of mentorship to you. And with Neil, like I, you know, I learned an awful lot of different recording techniques and uh, like different approaches. And I mean, he's a total like, you know, gearhead as well. Like he's always buying new bits of equipment and wanting to try something new. And so, you know, we, we went through like every mic preamp under the sun and every mic under the sun and kind of like lived off uh, cheap fast food to like fuel our, uh, our equipment habit basically. And it was, you know, it, it, was, it, was, it was brilliant brilliant learning curve um and then from there that that's when i started working uh for spike um basically a, a mutual friend of of um well, a friend of spikes and um a friend of mine he he said spike was back in the country and needed somebody to help him out for a little while and obviously i jumped to the chance because i mean he's he's you know an absolute legend an incredible talent and i you know it was a great opportunity to you know learn from one of the best Right. And I mean, you did some, you've worked on some huge records with him. Oh, yeah, it was, it was, you know, I mean, he, you know, his, his discography is, you know, immense. And, um, you know, I, I, the, 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 amazing thing was like aside from the aside from getting to work on those those projects which i think like a lot of people feel like when you're an engineer or a producer or a mixer whatever your your role is you know it it's always it's always nice to work on something you're proud of but it's always even better when you you work on something and you know that you know people around the world are listening to it and so that was a that 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 for me was one of the most gratifying things about going to work for him is is working on these projects that were really you know reaching the masses and feeling like you know I I got to play a small part in them. There's probably good and you know interesting for you in terms of you know you, you're running your own show, you got your own studio, you're producing bands, you're building studios, and now you're at a new level, of course. But now you're now you're the assistant again. Yeah, absolutely. But you know that's the thing. I think. If you want to learn and progress, you've got to be willing to like taking taking a step back and like relinquishing, you know, control and understanding that, you know, there's there's a great opportunity to learn. That's, you know, that's worth its weight in gold, you know, like and I I mean I I definitely, you know, I I definitely think when I when I before I went to work for Spike, I think my understanding of mixing as a, you know, a process and an art form in its own right was completely different to what it is now um because up until that point you know i very very rarely if ever mixed something somebody else had recorded um or produced so it was you know it, it's a totally different mindset you know some, the, the, and when you're when you're working with you know local bands and band and artists on you know small budgets everything has to be done very very quickly so like the mix process you know um before working for spike was a very you know it was something that you were kind of doing as you were going and you you know doing doing it that way yes you'll get some you you can get good results but i think you know take tr- understanding mixing as a separate process was you know just revolutionary for me when you start with something that you did not record or you did not produce you know how do you how do you find the center of the mix or you know how do you start well, I think like the the like my compass for me is always trying to listen with the artist and the producer's ears. That's the that's the most important thing for me. It's like you know I feel like I'm when I'm when I when I get a, a production mix, you know the first thing I'll do is I'll sit down and I'll listen to it you know several times and understand what like the key players are, you know it within within a song or a, or a piece of music and and just and just understand what like where the direction is and what what you know what's what's either being achieved already and how can we make it you know it do that more or understand like where where do they want this to go and how do i get it there you know i i think i always 
I like mixing most of all because it fits like with my kind of my creative mindset in that like you do work like I I like being in the box that you are in when you're mixing because you you can't be too radical but you've also got to push the envelope a bit so you you're I I find like the way I generally start is um is is with the production mix and, and understanding what you know the artist and producer's intentions are and and making sure that there's you know a channel of communication open at, right from the get go so that you know we you know we can we can easily you know fix things or or you know if I've got a question or if they've got a question or if I send them a first pass and they don't like it or or I've send them a first pass and there's something that's that's like you know is like essential that isn't there that, that they can just come to me and in its and we we've got a we've got a, a good rapport from the get-go to, to 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 get it to where they want it to go you know i feel like mixing is very much about facilitating um and and being a fresh pair of ears to take things that that next step really yeah tell me tell me a time where where somebody uh where, where you totally missed well they're the ones you learn don't you they're the ones you learn from most of all when you don't when you don't like when you don't hit the nail on the head um first off um i think like whew, a good a good example like i i did um i did a song for an artist um probably about two years ago now and when and the song came in and the the production mix was like fairly like it felt fairly basic um and when i heard the song i just i thought this sounds like a pop smash to me and i really like i push i really pushed pushed it to 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 be that way but actually what they were going for was something much more lo-fi and much more you know like rough around the edges and so like i think in in that that was that was a case of where and again that was a learning curve to to how important it is to have a creative conversation before you get going to understand people's intentions and where they want to go with it because i think in that instance i i kind of heard the, re- the the production mix got excited and went for it and that you know that that's uh that that first pass was not how the song ended up being essentially it was it was much more like lo-fi and much more much more closed in sometimes when when i get a when i get a track and i and i hear i hear something very different or I hear something that that could potentially be added, whether that's you know at, at the extreme like some programming or some additional instrumentation, or or, or perhaps it's like a, a structural edit or, or whatever it might be. Um, if it's something something like that, I will always do that as an alt pass. So you know, I I like I w- I would. I always send, you know, send back a, a pass that is, you know, respectful to the vision. And then if I've got like a, a really strong idea, absolutely, I'll send an all pass. Because, you you know, it even if it even if somebody goes on, no, not quite like this, but maybe what if we did this? You can sometimes you can you can trigger ideas. And that's that's important. The flow has changed, you know, just the way that the music's being produced and mixed and like where where are those lines? And, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think I think that's been that's something that's definitely been happening pre pandemics, you know, like the, 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 the ability for people to be creative in their own right and at home and be able to, you know, cut vocals at home or record whatever they, they want, wherever they want, you know, and quite often you know the best creative minds are not always you know the best engineering engineers you know that's just that's just the the way it is and it's like and that's not not anyone's fault you sometimes i would say like in terms of what we what what comes through the door for me um a, a lot of the time these days is you know vocal vocal recording is you know it is an art form and and not always you know it's not always done brilliantly when it's um when it's done in not ideal locations without the expertise and so you know i'd certainly say that in in recent years and certainly over like the 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 pandemic times um there's a there's been a lot more focus on you know making sure that we're working with the the sort of best starting point in the vocals as possible um but i think like work workflow wise i mean i the the way I, I have a I have an assistant Nico Battistini who who's with me you know five days a week and you know works his ass off he's brilliant um, but he like he will you know generally what will happen is the parts will come in and he will get them into Pro Tools set them up organize them clean up vocals clean up whatever else needs cleaning up and just and lay it all out in in the way that I like it um, and I think there's we're not having him 
in the studio with me um, certainly for three months this year and he was working remotely not having that face-to-face communication um, it, it did it did change things slightly but we we sort of it and it took us a little while to adapt so uh, what what we found that you know I've I've found tools like uh, audio movers and and just being able to to stream stuff to each other and to artists and 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 producers or or labels whoever wants to jump on and and work on a mix live that's been that's been revolutionary you know that's been fantastic to be able to use that that technology and you know prior prior to the pandemic I, I was doing that but it's certainly become something that I lean on more now because it allows people to listen in their own space and and be able to make judgment calls without coming into my room which you know doesn't sound like their room on speakers that they don't they're not familiar with you know they can they can listen in the comfort of their own home or in their studio and and be able to really feed back you know with confidence yeah are you mixing on a console or are you or so i i have like a i have a hybrid setup um where i'm running um, an hd rig and then um a lot of outboard i I like working with outboard i you know you can obviously you, you can do it in the box no question but like for me it's i i what i one of the things i love about about working in studios and just generally being around this gear is being able to like get tactile with it and you know turn some knobs and push some faders you know that's that's half the half the fun of it for me so um what we i have a lot of basically i have a lot of stuff on on hardware inserts going into um avid hdios and then um i've recently put in one of the flock audio patches i don't don't know if you've seen those they're like they're they're these digital patch bays um and then because I have I have a lot of saturation devices that I tend to use on the mix bus or, you know, if I've got a few mix buses going, I'm, I I like to, I, I'll be mixing that, that equipment up quite a lot from track to track. And this just gives me a really simple way of recall, of recalling it, um, but also chaining devices together. And, you know, the, the fact that you can malt stuff on it is, is brilliant as well. So, yeah, it, it's kind of a hybrid. I mean, I do, I do an awful lot of work in the box, but I, there's, you know, nine times out of ten there's plenty of hardware on every mix i do um and i'd rather introduce the saturation that you know in in the outboard world um rather than doing it in the box if i can um whether that whether that's like whether that's just like me being uh me being precious about it but like or 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 whether there is actually like a major benefit to it it just feels better to me and i I think that's important good friend of mine tom monahan sent me uh charlie xcx how i'm feeling now Oh yeah. You know, you've been working with Charlie XCX for quite some time now. It's weird. It's weird. I think I've worked on like every one of her albums in some capacity or another. But like, yeah, I, you know, I, that 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 album is uh, that that kind of we that that happened right in the middle of the last you know the last lockdown. And I mean, it was you know really like it you know it was it was intense, really intense mixing that record. But but so much fun. Tell me about how those records you know the the kind of the walk through of those productions and then i was also going to ask you about your your relationship with ag cook i i yeah i mean it's it's um i mean that that record i kind of we we just gone into the lockdown um over here and then uh i think like the talk of this this record started happening and then from there it it went really well happened really quickly i mean it it was it was produced by ag and um bj burton and um that you know that and it just i mean the the speed at which we were doing things there was like towards the end was 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 you know crazy i think the last sort of day before we handed in all the mixes i was i'd been up for like 36 hours (laughs) pretty much um just because just because of like how close we were getting to the deadline um but i mean i I mean i can't i I think the the process there i mean charlie's just prolific with her output and and her ideas are 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 incredible and the, the way that that you know ag and and her have worked together for a long time and i mean i can't sort of can't speak for how like their their production process works but it certainly when when it when it comes to me um you know i always i always know where to go with it because you know ag's vision is always really clear and and having worked with him you know i've worked with him now probably for for about five years and i mean he like 
he he knows what he wants and he's got a he's got a great vision for his records and i always feel like in in that scenario it's it, w- when i get one of his his productions i you know i know i know kind of what the do's and don'ts are straight away uh, and i think it's a lot like playing in a band with somebody you know when you when you've played in a band with somebody for a long time you kind of instinctively know what they're gonna what they're gonna do you know you can you can jam a lot freer and i certainly find with 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 mixing uh his his productions that i i like i don't have to think about it as much now i kind of i can i can you know i know i like i know how far to take something and what is gonna not work and and what what is going to be liked and what is not going to be like you know 80% 80% of the time, 90% of the time, something like that. Um, and I mean, his, his, you know, his, his productions just really excite me because I mean, going back to like the, the what I was saying about, you know, um, multiply and like how those, those, um, how I love the way that you had that songwriting with, with the intertwined with these like crazy, like IDM moments, like his, his, sound palette and sound choices are just you know phenomenal and like the 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 his sound design is always really exciting to listen to for me you know i either when i when i first when i whenever i get one of his new product new productions in i'm it's always exciting to hear what i'm going to be working with and you know it's you, you know you're not going to be dealing with like a you know a, like kick drum snare drum you know hi-hats uh, a bass guitar a guitar or, you know there's going to be more it, it's all going to be it, it's all going to be a lot more complicated than that and and there are going to be sounds doing the functions of those things but are not necessarily going to be those things you know yeah that's interesting to talk about the actual function like each mix or or production has you know there are things in the uh, in the productions that have roles but the characters can change and still serve those purposes. I think that's something that the younger producers have been really good at, you know, where it's sort of like, you know, we don't need to adhere to this traditional sort of structure of what, what what those roles are like you're saying it's so easy now to like you know to you can you can put together something that sounds generic and okay in five minutes like by downloading a splice pack you know like it doesn't it doesn't take a a great deal of creativity to do that because the sounds have already been created you know you you can you you can put that together so something that's very quickly and and it doesn't and the thing is it 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 sounds lifeless to me. Like when when you when you hear when you hear stuff that's that's been produced in that way, you know, it it doesn't it doesn't excite me personally. And so when I hear like what 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 I want from music or what what excites me about music is when I hear people pushing boundaries and doing things that I haven't heard before. And you know, like sometimes if you've got something that is like a sound that is absolutely like ripping with distortion and like modulating other things in the mix, well, that's kind of cool because it's different you know and it's doing something different and it's and it's creating these like anomalies that you that maybe like are technically wrong but you know emotionally are exciting and and that that's that's really cool i feel like a lot of the stuff that's coming out now that is exciting people is 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 awesome because it it was a mistake or it was a technically flawed well, I think I think yeah, I, and I think there's there's like it's it's how things translate through different mediums in 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 some respects to 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 my mind anyway. Like I, you quite often you know if you listen to like a lot of like uh sound like SoundCloud demos, like a lot of like the mumble rap stuff, like that stuff is often like really blown out, like it really really blown out, like to, to and to the, and the, like to the point that it's just like everything caves in when an eight oh eight hits, you know. But that then that that's been happening for a, a little while, and it's sort of that works its way through to the mainstream because it becomes you know a sonic thumbprint, you know that like that people like. So it's like um, I think you know I would say that. It, it it varies from from project to project and person to person as to what I receive and then and you have to like you have to make the distinction of like if you remove that does it 
stop it sounding as good does it stop it feeling as good and if it does then it has to stay you know or like it has to be you know it, it has to be you know recreated in some way that that works you know without like without it um without it being detrimental further on down the line you know to whether that's like on streaming services or whether it's you know um you know a mastering engineer calling you up and shouting at you or whatever it might be not that that's happened just to, just there's a caveat to that <laughs> no no you know, you know like it's it's um it 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 varies i mean like it's i i think certainly the 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 stuff that um the stuff that i i receive from from ag isn't like that in any respect you know it's it's all very it it's all you know put together in a in a very professional manner you know like aside from being very clever it's uh, it's it's from when i receive parts it's 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 always super super easy to to work with um but but certainly other projects for sure that that is a that is definitely a something that happened i mean i guess at the end of the day it's the emotional resonance of whatever it is so yeah complete completely and i and i think and that that again you know like when i when when i'm trying to like recreate something that's you know maybe you know a reference mix might have come in and it's like you know slamming like you know minus four luffs or whatever and like you can't you can't give somebody back a mix that's like much much quieter than that because it it, like people won't understand you know like they don't like it's that's not what they they want they want you to to level up what they've done or you know improve it and so in that in that kind of instance you know you've got to find creative ways to reintroduce like that that distortion and that excitement and i mean that's like going back to the hardware that i use i mean that's something that that's why one of the reasons i love using hardware is that you can do that in creative ways you know you're running something out through like a like I, i've got this um black box hg2 and i mean that's just like that that's wicked for just for driving things and creating a saturation without like having everything coming back in in the red you know all right man well thank you and uh enjoy the your evening i guess it's evening there awesome uh, thank you so much for having me on Thanks for listening. Find us online at tapeop.com, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Until next time. Craig, 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 Craig,